Okay, thank you. Go ahead, Steele. Thanks for the introduction and welcome everybody to the Pressbooks monthly product update. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is what's happening right now with the Pressbooks Results pilot program. If you haven't heard before, Pressbooks Results is a solution that we have built that helps students with their learning and it gives instructors greater visibility into what students are learning. The way that it works is if you have built interactive activities, quizzes, other types of feedback assessments into your Pressbooks book using the free H5P integration, those will display in your book and students can do them. That happens normally on the open web, but if you're using Pressbooks results, you can configure those individual chapters for grading. And when you connect it to your LMS via LTI, the scores that students have scored on the H5P activities will be sent to your LMS gradebook. And you will also have a custom view built with Pressbooks that shows you the individual scores on individual activities. So the couple of things that this does is it helps students increase their motivation to engage with learning materials, usually to do formative assessments to repeat practice because they know that they can see how well they've done and their instructor can see whether they've done the activities and how well they've done. So that gives instructors visibility into who's engaging with the activity and who isn't. And also instructors can see who's struggling and who might need customized feedback, both on the individual level and overall in the course, you could say, hey, this is an activity that a lot of people are really not getting. That's what I want to start my next lecture with or my next course period. We'll, we'll dive a little deeper into this particular aspect because I saw a big percentage of the class struggled with it in the pre-reading. So that's what Pressbooks Results is. And we have a, a large number of people using the pilot this term. So you go to the next slide. Uh, right now, we're doing a pilot where we've invited anybody who wants to use this at any of the institutions to try it out and to be engaged with us in giving uh, user research and giving us feedback on it. We have over 30 participating institutions, and there's a big list of institutions. You might see your name there. Thank you for those of you who are participating. We have over 40 instructors that are using Pressbooks results in their courses. And I'm not sure the exact number of students, but it's in the thousands. And right now, they're using Pressbooks results in three of the four supported LMSs. We have courses in Canvas, Blackboard, and Brights, D2L Brightspace that are all using it. We thought we were going to have some people using it in Moodle, but they ended up not piloting it this term, but it is also usable and available in Moodle. So that's what's happening right now. And uh, those instructors are now uh, anywhere from two weeks to a month and a half into their courses and have been using Pressbooks results with students uh, across the board. So the overall status, things are going pretty smoothly. The re results is stable, it's reliable, it's working as expected. The biggest issue that we run into so far, occasionally students that have been completing activities haven't been having the grade recorded. And it's because they needed to adjust a cookie policy in their browser. Um, once it's adjusted, Pressbooks results works as expected. It most frequently happens on Mac devices and Apple iOS devices. So we've got some instructions for how to get around that. And we're working on a building a notification that will display the first time a student launches an activity that just informs them hey, this won't send grades until you make this change so that it reduces frustration. Um, the big priority features already that we've learned about, we know that if you are a network manager or an institutional manager, you're running a Pressbooks program on your campus, you want to understand more about who's using Pressbooks results, where they're using it, how widely it's used. So we're planning to build and display uh, more information about usage and some analytics about how and where Pressbooks results is being used at your institution soon. For individual instructors, the biggest piece of feedback that we've heard so far is it's great being able to see an overall grade and I love being able to see individual scores, but I'd like more information. I wanna know what did students respond? Sometimes they're giving free response answers. They'd like to be able to see the free response answers. and be able to just have a little bit more insight into what students are answering that determines the points or the grades that they get. And so uh, Michelle is working on designing those things. She's not here today, but I think next month she'll probably be able to present some of the progress that the tech team has made uh, in building those, those features for, for new instructors. Go to the next slide. Uh, the big news, I guess, is if you would like to try Pressbooks results in a demo course, you can. We now have built a demo course in Canvas, D2L, Brightspace, uh, Moodle, and Blackboard. And anybody who would like to have access to that course 
we're adding people and and may, are going to open those courses up. We already have a list of a bunch of people who've told us they'd like to be added to a demo course, and we'll be working on that and doing that this week and next. But if you or anyone at your institution would like to go to a demo course in any of these LMSs and try it out, you can. Canvas and Moodle do allow self-registration. So the link here on the slide will take you to the self-registration instructions, and I will paste that in the chat. So here are the self-registration instructions for Canvas and Moodle. If you would like to be registered and not have to do it yourself, there's also a short survey that just asks for the information that we need to be able to register in one of those courses. If you want access to D2 or Brightspace or Blackboard, they don't support user self-registration, so we'll have to add you ourselves, which we're happy to do. Go ahead and fill out that survey form that I just dropped in the chat, and we'll be glad to add you. So that's what's happening, and we are happy to get people in early. The other thing that we're going to be doing, which is pretty exciting, is we will we have a, a session scheduled next month on October 15th, where we will be doing a demo course walkthrough. Uh, it'll be a webinar where we show people what the demo course is, how to use it, how to uh, act in it, and to do all the things that you would do with Pressbooks results. That's uh, taking place from 1 to 2 p.m. on October 15th, and there is a registration link where you can register in advance. That registration link is right here in the chat. I just pasted that in the chat, and we'd love to have anyone who wants to attend come, and uh, we can take all comers, really. Uh, I won't show the demo course in great detail today because I know we have a lot to cover, but I'm happy to answer questions about it uh, or ask, answer questions about the pilot generally. I'll stop and look at the chat to see if there's anything I missed, or if you want to unmute and ask questions, I'm open to it right now. Um, I think that I'm on the list for wanting to participate in the demo. If I fill out that form and I'm already on the list, is that a big pain? No, not at all. Okay. We won't get, we'll, we'll, we'll just add you. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Jamie. Um, so the idea of the demo course, if I didn't mention it earlier, you when you register for the demo course, you'll be enrolled in that course as a student. So you'll experience Pressbooks results from a student point of view. The demo course will have instructions for how to use it. They'll have a discussion forum where you can ask questions about Pressbooks results or about anything that comes up. And then you'll see there's four different graded activities. One's from a humanities discipline, one's from a language learning discipline, one's from a anatomy medical discipline, and one's from a chemistry kind of STEM discipline. Um, each time you complete those activities, your scores will be updated in the gradebook, and you will be able to use the Pressbooks results viewer, but only see your student view. If you really need access to the course as an instructor, you can also request that. Um, we're a little cautious about giving people full instructor access to those courses because they can change what everybody sees. So, But we generally will trust you. If you really need instructor access, we can give it to you. It's not substantially different from what the student sees. It's just more. So... Hopefully the demo course will help instructors understand what this would be like to experience with their students. There's also instructions in the demo course. If you'd like to use Pressbooks results in your course, Pressbooks results is going to be generally available to all enterprise clients starting in the next upcoming term, so January. As long as you work things out with your network manager, we'd be happy to have you use Pressbooks results and hopefully have a great experience doing it. Uh, you can let us know or you can just simply proceed on your own if it's activated for your network. So there's a question from uh, Lauren about whether there will be a notification about the cookie issue in certain browsers and results. Um, certain browser settings prevent the grade pass back. So Steele, do you want to take that? Or we also have Christopher, the team is building that. Yeah. So. so I don't know. I know that our team is working on it. I don't know details beyond that. I, I'm not on the product team anymore, but Christopher is here, could probably answer that question more accurately than I could. Or maybe Ricardo, I don't know. So Christopher, Ricardo, do you want to take that? Yes. So uh, we are working on uh, some notifications for the for students. Um, we we had something we thought was really ready to go today, and we've actually found we need a little bit more improvement to release it. So um, it's in the works. Um, that's all I can say for now. Uh, but essentially what will happen is when people do LTI links, they'll get a notification saying that uh, they need to have third-party cookies enabled and then the instructions on how to do it in their browser. And we just want to make sure that we get all contexts and we don't confuse people in other contexts where they don't need this. And so there's a little bit of refinement needs to be done on this. 
All right. I Thank think you the so answer much. is we're very close on that, Lauren. So, all right, other questions? Uh, in the interest of time, then I think the okay. next slide. There's, a, there's oh, yeah, one more thing I want to get to. So the third track is there are some people who don't want to use the demo course and aren't teaching it, but do want to give us feedback and tell us about what they would like to see or the needs they have. So there's a user research track, and right now what's happening is Michelle, who's not here today, UX designer, is doing a uh, 60 minute kind of one on one interviews with anyone who has feedback to give about Pressbooks results, and so. Those are happening. Uh, there, she, her calendar is is linked there. It's, she's available for booking. Um, there's 60 minute interviews typically, and we're offering a $25 gift card to thank anyone who participates in those interviews. I will post the link to that in the chat. Um, but that's it, and I'll pass it on. Uh, that's that's all I had to share about that. Unless yeah. there's any. Questions. Thank you. No, yeah, I was gonna say, uh, please go ahead and put the link for Michelle's um, type. And by the way, this is, just to reiterate, this is the pilot instructors who are actively using Pressbooks results with students. That is her focus right now. And I think she is already reaching out to those instructors directly. But if you have them, if you know of them, if you are one of them, um, you know, and you want to uh, take a little time and, and do this, we would appreciate it. So. Oh, um, okay, there is a, there are a couple more questions. So Amy uh, Hofer, um, uh, okay, question on pricing for Oregon and um, update on pricing models. Um, so Amy, I think um, probably for you is uh, having a conversation with John um, is probably the right thing to do and I can loop back with John as well. Um, uh, Oregon is a, um, is a, is a multi-institution so that it's a consortium. And so our, our pricing model, um, on this, uh, uh, does require, um, individual institutions to do a premium buy-in for, uh, establishing the LTI integration and so forth. Um, but Amy, let's pick up that conversation again, um, because we would love to see if there's a way that we can make your folks. And uh, so Jeannie Young, any update on the accessibility of H5P interactions? We can't in good faith encourage uh, instructors to use it until it is because of the new Title II regulations. And um, so this is one I am not prepared to speak to. Um, I, I, I can give a short answer and then also give you request more information. So there are, as people know, H5P is an open source plugin, and there's something like 40 something different activity types. Most of the H5P activity types are WCAG 2.1 AA compliant and would be fully accessible to users of uh, screen readers and other assistive technology. There are a few ex activity types that are not fully accessible. Like there's a, a recorder activity type that requires you to use speech. And there are some activity types that are image-based and would require vision and are very difficult to use if you don't have vision. Those are activity types that we discourage instructors from using for accessibility reasons. Um, and some of those are graded and some of them are not graded. Um, but I'm not sure if I fully understood all of the concerns about accessibility or whether um, we're aware of them. Jeannie, is there more that you'd want to add or share about the broader concerns about H5P accessibility? Sure. The Our um, Accessibility Center reviewed the most commonly used activities, including multiple choice, short answer, the, I mean, the basic things that anyone would use that we thought might be accessible and found issues with all of them. Mm -hmm. I'm, they are working on writing up a report to send to you and then possibly also did D2L bought out H5P, didn't they? So yeah, we're purchased. hopeful because they bought it that it would be it will be accessible by 2025. But I just didn't know if you knew anything other than that. I, I haven't seen that report. Um, we did our own analysis and did not find those same accessibility concerns. So it may be that one or either of us is mistaken or that we have different interpretations of, of what that is. We, I, we'd be interested to see it. We don't have full control over H5P, obviously, as it's not software that we've written, but we are very concerned with accessibility. If there are accessibility uh, issues that we can remediate, we're really serious about doing that. If they're the ones that we need to file upstream, we're happy to file them upstream and 
historically we've had a pretty good working relationship with H5P developers and they've been responsive to a lot of pull requests or other concerns that we've raised with them. So if there is a report that's that's available for us to see and to circulate, um, we would be interested to see and to help escalate those concerns as as they come up. So Jeannie, yeah, would, uh, would your would your team when as they are completing that report, would they be willing to share a copy of it with us? Yes, definitely. Okay. Um, thank you. We would we would be very interested in seeing that. All right. Uh, any other questions that we've missed? Okay. Uh, okay. There's a request for a podcast plugin. So thank you. Uh, thank you for mentioning that, Frank. All right, um, we are gonna move on to our next topic. So uh, we did a customer satisfaction survey in July, and actually I don't need to start talking about it because all of this is what uh, Bashak will be telling us about. So uh, Bashak, I will continue to drive for you, but go ahead. Perfect, thank you. Um, well, hello everybody. Uh, so I wanted to take a moment to share some insights from the CSAT survey that we did. So first of all, thank you everyone who participated in this year's survey. Uh, our, our aim, our goal was to reach at least hear from half of our clients and we have achieved 57%. So that's great. And hopefully next year uh, we will have higher participation rates. And if you didn't have the time, you can always use the chat like Frank just did and give us uh, your, uh, your thoughts. I'm happy to hear that you're happy. I'm also happy here to hear if you're not happy and why so we can help with that um so moving on to some insights the first thing that we asked was who are our uh, our uh, administrators of press books uh this was the first uh first time we asked this question it was interesting for us to see uh who is the driving force behind and if you see the math doesn't add up for a reason um it is because we allowed multiple uh choices uh multiple uh, people allowing um what do I say? Uh, people's ability to answer uh, multiple things at the same time, uh, because we know that uh, client sites sometimes share management of press books. Uh, so primarily it is um, libraries at 70%. Uh, nearly a third of our, um, of our sites of teaching and uh, learning centers are primarily responsible. 15% uh, are systems and consortia and only at 10% are uh, central IT. Um, maybe we can move on to the next slide. Um, so we also asked what types of projects are our clients using uh, Pressbooks for? And the answer has been uh, open educational resources and more. Uh, virtually everyone is uh, is using uh, Pressbooks to publish OER and nearly half publish training or professional learning resources and curriculum. It's also interesting to note the wide prevalence of, of student publishing projects, including open pedagogy at 44%. Uh, 20% are publishing administrative publications like reports, strategic plans, handbooks, and policy documents. Uh, which sounds great, and a quarter report uh, publishing teaching and learning materials that are not openly licensed. We can go to the next slide. Um, of course, we want to know how do our clients feel about Pressbooks? Well, the good news for us is that our clients seem to be happy. On a scale of 1 to 10, we get scores above 8. Uh, and this is an improvement uh, since our last survey. And of course, we would love to see a continuing improvement uh, in the next years to come. Uh, so how do we measure and what do we measure? Uh, we can go on to the next slide. Uh, so there is a metric that is widely used uh, called an a promoter score. Um, it is usually a resource suggests that a high net promoter score correlates well with uh, business health and also outlook for growth as well. So the MPS is based on one question. On a scale of one to 10, how likely are you to recommend press books to a friend or colleague? Recognizing the, the importance of word of mouth recommendations, it's important to understand whether customers would recommend uh, uh, press books or not and why. So the MPS is typically calculated by taking a percentage of promoters that give a, a, a nine and a 10, and which give a one uh, and six, and seven or eights are counted as neutrals. Um, so it is, it is great to see that we have 62% of promoters here uh, at this uh, this year's survey, and uh, the tractors are only at 3%. So we hit an MPS score of 59. It's also uh, important to note that generally for tech companies, an MPS score over 20 is, is considered pretty good. So we are uh, delighted to see uh, these great results. Uh, 
uh, of our survey. So, so what is it that makes uh, Pressbooks so awesome? Uh, a lot of folks say, well, at the top, actually, ease of use and flexibility are the number one thing that, uh, that people have cited. Um, after that, it is our people and the support that we provide to the communities that we support. Um, helpful features and functionality are also uh, uh, of the top that have been um, selected. And the fact that we're well suited to making, to making open textbooks are, are, are things that makes Pressbooks awesome as what we hear is how we hear from, from our clients. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Well, so we also asked, what concerns do you have about Pressbooks? Um, it was very interesting to see. It's great, but it doesn't do everything. Um, we would love to do everything. We want Pressbooks to do everything. Uh, but at the same time, um, uh, we have to be mindful of the things uh, that we can add in terms of uh, features and the capacity that we bring. I'm going to talk about that a little bit uh, later. Uh, but the thing that we saw the most was that there are some additional features or capabil capabilities that we do not offer today. Um, so the next thing that that uh, that we're going to talk about is actually exactly that. So what features uh, new features would clients uh, most like to see? Well, as I said, in an ideal world, we would love to be able to deliver uh, everything that our clients request. And, and we got a lot of requests, which is great. It's always a great sign when we hear this engagement. When we get these requests, it tells us that you're happy to use our software and you want it uh, to do better. So we, we actually really like hearing from you. Um, in reality, we are a lean team with limited resources and we have a commitment to um, delivering an affordable solution. Uh, so that means we have to be very careful in choosing our priorities and what we're adding to, um, uh, to the things that we want to work on. So to help these choices, we used a survey to capture some information as to what it is that the features uh, that, that you want that our clients would like to see. So we created two lists uh, of frequently requested features. Uh, one included features that would improve the process of creating and publishing books, and the second one focused on improvements on how to, uh, for people to use and manage the work that they create. So let me share the answers to that. Um, so the the desire uh, the desired features for creating and publishing uh, books. One feature was above everything else, as you can see, an accessibility checker. And this was followed by improvements to Google Docs and uh, Microsoft Word integration, import export, and then improving the process for finding, using, and attributing openly licensed images. They were at the top. Uh, the other question that we asked in the next slide, uh, the desired features for using and managing existing books. The top three were ability to track textbook adoption and adaptation, having a broken link checker, and an ability to display ancillary materials. Um, so what does all of this mean? Uh, we can go to the next slide, Julie. Um, it is important to note that we're, when we're making our decisions about what are the things that we're going to work on next? What is going to what is going to go onto our note roadmap? Uh, we look at, uh, at a few factors. One of which is what are the preferences of clients. Uh, another one is how will our users and our clients going to be impacted by the decisions that we're making in terms of bringing in new features, um, and also what does our product discovery uh, and user research tell us? Um, and probably on top of that, what is the cost of building those? And what is the complexity of building, maintaining, and supporting those needs? Because it's not just about delivering a feature, but we have to be able to maintain it. And we have to be able to provide the, the support that will be um, that you will need when you're using this feature, whether there's something that that you know we need to help you understand how to use this feature or you're yeah, or you're seeing a bug or whatever it might be. So the CSAT survey is absolutely an important data input for us, uh, but it doesn't mean it is 100% commitment for us to deliver on everything that we heard and uh, and uh, right away. So, uh, and on that note, I'm going to talk about what is it that we're going to focus. So what is the Pressbooks team going to focus on in the next um, three months? First of all, onboarding yours truly. I am definitely demanding a lot from our team in terms of uh, support and I'm, I'm seeing amazing support. Uh, I ask a lot of questions, uh, questions I haven't asked before. I'll talk about you know how I ended up here and how I came here. Um, 
so there's there's that support coming uh, coming from the team on uh, helping this leadership change. Uh, we also, of course, more than that, are very committed to having a successful Pressbooks pilot. We want to bring in the next three months three or more than three significant improvements to our Pressbooks results. Um, we also want to make sure that there is enough operational data visibility to our clients. So we want to make sure that you have the, the, the um, statistics that you're going to need to be able to uh, adopt uh, using Pressbooks better and help uh, engage from your campuses as well. We also want to bring a transparency around the roadmap that we are building. So these are the things that we're going to focus in the next three months. And you're going to keep hearing about them from us through these product um, updates. You're going to hear them through our newsletters if you signed up for them. So this is what we're working on for the next three months. And um, that's all I have for this section. I'm going to turn back over to Julie uh, as our host. Thank you, Bashak. Um, so I will reiterate uh, just what Bashak said. So we loved getting the feedback and the guidance from our clients about what your wish lists include. And um, in just in terms of managing expectations, unfortunately, we're not going to be delivering everything on those wish lists in the next three months. But um, we are um, we are uh, making some improvements to our roadmap process that will um, will help uh, communicate that both internally and externally more clearly. And we are excited about the prospect of being able to start working on some of those as well as other um, other improvements and, and requests that we get on a regular basis. Um, so with that, uh, thank you, Bashak, for going through the highlights of the customer satisfaction survey. Any questions um, from our, our audience here about the customer satisfaction survey or the data that we shared? Pause for that. Okay. Um, then uh, if questions do come up, um, next we're gonna move into our town hall. And so if you have questions, whether they're about the satisfaction survey or anything else that we've talked about today or other things generally, um, this is what a town hall is for. So we're going to start the town hall with a few words from Bashak uh, by way of introduction. And she officially became our CEO on September 1st. Um, and, uh, and then we will open things up uh, for questions that you might have for her as she is taking on the leadership. Um, of Pressbooks, we also have other members of our Pressbooks team. Um, and so if you have questions that stump Bashak, she has a team here that is also willing to um, to step up and, and share perspectives. So, uh, oh, so there is a question from Cheryl. Were you surprised by the way priorities were ranked in the survey or what were, were those priorities expected? So Bashak, do you want to take that question? Um, you also, so Steele as our lead, our customer experience lead, definitely has opinions about, about answering that question. So um, you wanna, I'll, I'll turn it over to you, Bashak, you can take it and or let Steele answer and then we'll open up into your, your uh, town hall comments. Yeah, sure. So I'll take a very quick stab at it and then I'm gonna turn over to Steele. So were we surprised? Uh, no, uh, there are things that we have been hearing. We're always, uh, we're always watching out for comments that come through our support uh, uh, channel and also our, uh, our account, uh, our account executives are constantly talking with you and so is our customer success uh, lead still. Um, so, but that doesn't mean that, that we're not seeing it from a different perspective now. When, when you see through a survey and you see how much uh, significance is put on one versus the other, it's definitely more eye-opening than hearing, uh, you know, through the grapevine uh, uh, throughout the time. And on that note, I'm going to turn over to Steele. Yeah, I'd say similar to Jacques, yes and no. I think at the big picture level, there weren't a lot of big surprises. Like we, we provided a populated list of things that we knew clients were asking us about. So we kind of pre-selected choices for people. So there weren't a ton of huge surprises there. I think the relative weight and and the number of votes that certain issues or certain features got was surprising. But again, I think this is only a partial view of what users want because we're asking network managers rather than end users we're providing a pre-selected list. And there's only one or two sentence descriptions of what those features actually are. And so really understanding what all of our users want most is 
much more nuanced than this, but this was, I think, a really helpful start to just say like relative priorities, big picture, what matters most to you. Uh, I think it was educational. I'm not sure. I probably wouldn't use the adjective surprising as the first adjective, but there were, it was certainly in, informative. We learned a lot. But I, I mean, we didn't know precisely all of this going in, but I also don't think that we really had strongly held opinions about what people wanted most. And then, oh, we were really shocked either. Yeah. How about you, Cheryl? Were you surprised? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, me too. I would say probably the same. Some of them I was like, oh, I didn't realize that was that important to people. All right, thank you, Steele and Bashak. Uh, and, and, and so I will also note, and I put this in the chat, but um, part of what this guides us on is where to focus our, our next, uh, you know, our appetite for where do we focus next and starting to do discovery conversations um, about what really are the current pain points and then what are the ways that, uh, the variety of ways that Pressbooks might help address those pain points. And so, um, for example, with Accessibility Checker, we wanna make sure we understand more deeply what specifically are those pain points so that as we choose a path, we're choosing something that really does address those pain points and isn't just something that you know, is labeled accessibility checker, but may not actually address the real issues that our customers are, are facing day by day. Um, and bringing authors and, and kind of the, the full range of users into that. So, um, so thank you. Uh, we, again, appreciate knowing what's most important for you and, and using that to help uh, prioritize the things that we focus our energy on as well. Okay, um, Bashak. We will turn things over to you. So Bashak took the helm from Hugh McGuire, our founder CEO. Hugh is still in the picture. Um, he's our executive chairman and uh, and has um, in, he engages with us um, particularly on strategic direction uh, type issues. Any of you who are attending open the Open Ed conference in person next or in next month, um, he will be there as well. Um, as will Bashak. So be sure if you're there uh, to come and meet Bashak in person. Um, she's a very warm and lovely person, so you'll enjoy that. Um, and with that, uh, let's turn things over to Bashak. Yeah. Okay. So um, my name is Bashak Büyükçeren. If you want to have a really big challenge in how to pronounce a Turkish name, I am originally from uh, Turkey or Turkey, as uh, uh, Turkey is now chosen to, to be referred to as Turkey in, in international um, areas. So I moved to Canada in 2008 and then moved back to Turkey for a short period of time while waiting for my paperwork to come through. And then again in 2013. So I have been a longtime resident of, of Canada. Um, I have held leadership roles in finance and customer success and operations and often in multicultural companies with folks from uh, different countries. And that's definitely a very interesting experience to have. Um, about five years ago, I joined Pressbooks as a chief operating officer. And uh, what I can say, what attracted me to Pressbooks most is, is obviously its mission to transform educa education through open and accessible digital publishing. Um, it wasn't just about the technology that Pressbooks provides, but it is about how we can support educators and students in sharing knowledge and making learning more accessible. I did my uh, uh, graduate degree uh, uh, in Turkey at uh, Istanbul University, and my four-year education cost my parents, with today's money, probably less than $100. That includes all tuition, all the textbooks that we used. So it is dear to my heart to to see that education is accessible to as many folks as it can be. Um, so it's one of the things that 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 uh, got me more excited about joining Pressbooks. And as the chief operating officer, one of the things that I that I really focused on is something that I really believe that if we have happy employees, that we end up having happy clients because happy employees mean we will be more creative in the way we provide solutions. We're going to be more in tune with what our clients are saying, and we're going to be more focused on achieving the mission that we're trying to achieve. So I've always believed that, and therefore I try to uh, help with our leadership team create a more uh, people-centered culture uh, that uh, uh, that helped bring those um, happy employees and therefore have have happy clients. And I'm happy to see, uh, and I've said happy five times already in one sentence, which is great. 
Um, uh, it's great to see in our CSAT surveys that uh, our assumptions are true, that our clients are happy, and, and uh, we're going to do everything that we can to continue that growth and see how else we can support you. So um, what ex excites me most uh, right now is the opportunity to continue pushing the boundaries of how uh, DIY uh, digital publishing can support learning and student success for the open education community and beyond. And obviously, we're committed to improving how we serve our educators and learners, and we'll continue to listen to our community uh, to address their most uh, pressing needs. And so... I've spoken a lot today. We talked about the CSAT survey. We talked about my background. Um, and one thing when I just, uh, I said, I'm demanding a lot from our team in helping me on board. That is because I know a lot about Pressbooks and our team, um, but uh, I want to know more about our clients. And therefore I'm having more conversations with our sales and customer facing team. Uh, I'm trying to get to know all of you more. I'm very happy to connect with with, uh, with our clients through uh, LinkedIn, through email, through conferences that we might see each other, through any one-on-one -on -one calls that you might wanna have. But um, so what I'm trying to say is like, I want to get to know you more. So what questions would you have for me and or the Pressbooks team uh, that we should answer or what are some things that you would like for me to keep an eye out for you? So I'm gonna open it up to, uh, to some questions now. And I'll give uh, a moment to pause. Much of the chat. Amy, please go ahead. Hi, I'm Amy. I'm with Open Oregon Educational Resources, and um, congratulations. And it's really nice to get to know a little bit about you. I'm just curious, you know, um, I think of Hugh as such a vision person, um, and that's really been part of how I understood his leadership of Pressbooks. Um, you know, as a founder and as a like really person with um, like really big far reaching vision. And do you see the CEO role changing now that you're moving away from also having that founder role in your background compared to how Hugh did? Like, what do you, what do you see like really big picture long-term? Right, that's that's great. Um, it must be a very experience, a very different experience become being a founder and then leading a team, and a different experience when not being a founder but but uh, leading that team. So, but at the end of the day, the role of a CEO is to provide a, a a vision and a direction, a strategic direction for the team. How I see my role is really to tune in a lot more to the industry, the trends that we see there, and hearing from our clients to help shape that vision. Uh, I don't think anybody should come in and say, here's where we're going to go and this is the right way. I think we need to be open to being agile and understanding what are some things that are changing and how can we adapt in supporting our in our in uh, supporting the, the communities that we serve. So I see my role very similar to Hughes, but probably coming uh, a little bit from a different uh, different background. I'm hoping that my background in having worked with customer success teams will actually contribute to building that vision together so that where we want to go is, is where you will want to come along with us. So I don't want to take Pressbooks somewhere where you're not going to be, want to be a part of it. So it is important for me to understand where that direction should go. And that will be meaningful to our original mission. And it will be meaningful to the challenge, to the challenges that the, uh, uh, the educators are seeing in this so we can continue serving. Thank you for the question, Amy. Any other questions? I feel like I'm I'm giving oral exams right now. It's exciting back to be back in school. <laughs> Did I do well? I'm like I yes, I am a very extroverted person. Um and I think that's going to help a lot in building those relationships. I don't see uh, my role as someone who's going to come in and hear a couple of things. I see my role as I'm now going to be building a beautiful network of continued friendship and meaningful uh, relationships with you as partners in your journey uh, so that we can, we can continue to build on that and we can continue to serve you. So uh, I think being extrovert is a little bit helpful there. Um, if we don't have any more questions, maybe I can, maybe I can ask you a question. Um, so what would you like me 
as the new CEO to come and understand in what's in what's happening in your organization so that we can advance the work that Pressbooks is, is doing for you? Are there things that you want me to, to tune in on more? Are there things that you want me to hear or keep my ear open? Uh, English is my second language, so every once in a while, I'll just make up a phrase. It will sound funny, but hopefully it will, it will be helpful. So I'll keep my ear open. I don't know if that's a saying in English, but cer certainly is in Turkish. What would you like me to, to, um, to hear from you? if anything. And while also people think about that or they write about it in chat, this is not the last time I'll be asking this question, nor do you have to answer this right now. F feel free to, con uh, to connect with me on LinkedIn or send me an email. I believe the last slides we're going to be sharing my email address. Uh, so you can always drop me a line. I'm, I'm always going to be, I promise I'll always be happy to hop on a call with you to discuss your issues. Or uh, you know, if you want to have a brainstorming session about things, I will uh, I'll be delighted to do that. So uh, it is okay not to not to answer right now, but come back later. Chuck, there was a question in the chat. I'll read it out loud for people who can't yes. see it. Um, Michelle asked one of my colleagues who can't make it asked me to ask the following questions. One, I would like to know if they are planning to use ethical AI how they avoid tainted deep learning sets, ones that were cloned from unethically generated sets built on the open internet. Two, if they plan to use AI, how will they deal with the environmental cost of deep learning processing and generation? Well, I think these are very tough questions and I don't know if I will be able to provide answers that are gonna be fully satisfactory and here's why. Um, so our approach to AI so far has been thoughtful and strategic, uh, and that's for a few reasons. The, uh, the AI is an incredibly fast evolving uh, technology, and we recognize there's a huge potential uh, that AI will bring to education. But at the same time, we also have to be very mindful of these ethical concerns. Uh, so we, uh, not only the, the, the ethical considerations, but there's also data security, there's privacy, there's, there's also things that, that we need to be uh, aware of. So um, I think as AI continues to evolve, we're going to have to stay agile and adapting to it. And I can't tell you that I have a very solid policy right now that I can say, here are the answers to all of the questions. I don't know if somebody can come and say, here are the right answers to all of these questions, but it's certainly something that we are thinking about as a team. Um, but at the same time, uh, while we're thinking about how can we adapt AI also as Pressbooks, we also have to be mindful about what I said earlier in terms of what are some things that, that we need to be aware of in terms of what can we deliver next. So thinking about AI is something that we're continuously doing, uh, but the fact that there isn't a written response somewhere that you can refer to is also because we are seeing all of the implications of AI and the concerns around it along with you. Um, so I don't know if that's a if that's a desired answer, but that is the the answer that I do have right now. I don't know if anybody from the team uh, would like to um, share their opinions um, uh, on that. Um, uh, or still, go ahead, please. Yeah, I'd say I think at Pressbooks, I've I've heard and seen a range of opinions about the utility or even the desirability of AI in the software space and in the educational uh, sphere that we work and serve people in. And to date, we have not, oops, I meant to put my hand down. To date, we haven't developed an AI integration and I have not worked on any plans, immediate plans to, to build AI integrations or to build AI into Pressbooks. Um, that may change, but to date it hasn't. And I didn't hear anything Bashak's answer saying, hey, we're charging down the AI track and this is my vision for it. So. So far, we've uh, remained, I think, cautious and somewhat skeptical for some of the probably similar reasons underlying that question. But uh, if there are legitimate opportunities to improve education and improve the experience for learners that 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 don't offend you and other people, then we would we would be stupid not to consider them. I think it's it's also important to note, you know, when when AI became when ChatGPT became publicly available, AI is not it's not something new. It has been, uh, it has been, uh, you know, it's been around for a little while, but it is now so much more in our lives. 
everyone and their uncle ended up having an AI project when it first came about. And a lot of them died. A lot of them are still trying to, uh, you know, uh, hold strong. I think it's important for a company like Pressbooks not to jump on the AI ship just for the sake of jumping on the AI ship. We need to be uh, very thoughtful in the way approaching AI saying, what problem are we trying to solve? What are some implications that if we end up introducing something, what is that going to mean for us? What is it going to mean for our clients? What is it going to mean for our students? So there's so much to consider that as Pressbooks, we have been um, uh, consciously taking a step back and saying, let's not rush to jump on the AI train. Let's see what's happening and let's see what the some of the desires that are coming from our clients and then really answering a particular need rather than saying, hey, we've got something that's about AI because, you know, that's what everybody's doing right now. I think Pressbooks has been thoughtful in that way um, throughout his history in under huge leadership. And I certainly have uh, the intention of, of continuing and doing that. We don't want to do things that just for the sake of doing something because it's a popular thing to do, because it's the new shiny object that everybody's interested in, interested in. it's important to do things uh, consciously. So, uh, that is the end of my statement. Thank you. Um, I, I want to also just note that the ethical and the legal questions are real and they're unresolved. And our, we also know that our customer base in the open education community in particular and education generally is very concerned about those issues. And many of our clients are, uh, are the victims of, you know, whose work has been used in, um, uh, in violation of, of copyright law and so forth. And those are among the legal issues that are not resolved. We are a publishing product and it would be disingenuous to jump onto something at a point where those really serious issues are unresolved. And we, so we also are having a lot of conversations about how our clients are finding value in this and, and we're exploring and looking for things, but our cautious I think cautious and skeptical is is good we don't want to um we don't want to rush into something that uh that will turn out to to be a, a violation of the broader the broader purposes and what we stand for so uh Lauren hi yeah um congratulations also on your new role I just um have kind of a train of thought that hopefully will make sense, but just in kind of reflecting on like big picture things when I think about press books at my institution, um, I feel like a topic that I want to hear more about is that, um, you know, it's a lot at a lot of institutions, OER support typically is grounded in the library. And I think, um, this idea of kind of publications and texts and books um, is sort of like the foundation of how we think about OER. Um, but I think that the um, this issue of kind of like courseware and interactives and modules um, being like the future of o OER um, and that being addressed with Pressbooks results, which is really exciting. Um, it, I, I feel like what I'm interested in is kind of the fact that so much of that is handled at our institutions by entities outside of the libraries. Um, and, you know, usually by like a tech department or um, uh, just people kind of handling the LMS. And so, um, yeah, I think this is just to say, like, I'm kind of interested in where um kind of discussion about OER goes given that like so many of us or, or many of the folks kind of here or kind of leaders in OER are libraries based but um we'll obviously be kind of entering more of the conversations with people on our campuses that deal with um LMS with um like learning modules learning objects that kind of thing and I feel sort of like, I don't know what that's going to look like in terms of um, the future of OER. So that's just like a um, topic that I want to hear more about. And that obviously I feel like Pressbooks is kind of like at the center of. So, yeah. yeah exactly. 
So thank you, thank you for the question and the and the comment. So uh, Pressbooks always has a long-standing commitment to the open educational community, and that focus will obviously uh, absolutely continue. Uh, open education has always been central to who we are, and we do remain dedicated to supporting our educators, institutions, and learners. Um, and at the same time, we're also exploring ways to expand our research and impact and 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 the impact it brings by by meeting broader needs. So um, like you say, you know, this is where OER is right now, and there's a lot of uh, moving parts to it that that will change with the future. So I guess I'm going to take everything that you've said and continue to 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 think about that, so that we can, uh, when we move further with with Pressbooks, we'll be able to continue building on those. Um, is there any uh, comments from our team about what Lauren just said? Yeah, I just posted something in the chat. This was from the CSAT survey, Lauren, that we, wasn't in Bashak slides, but we asked people, network managers, who's, which department or unit is primarily responsible for managing Pressbooks? And you could give multiple answers so that they don't sum to 100, but you can see about three quarters of our, our clients, it's the library who manages Pressbooks and who manages the publishing program. But there's a significant, and then there's the teaching and learning center. It's a relatively low percentage right now where it's central IT. I think that's a little bit atypical of enterprise software tools. I think those percentages have probably changed over time. And so we, we're in the position of supporting a couple of different kind of university cultures who administer Pressbooks and often have really different approaches. Like librarians tend to have a certain, not always, I don't want to speak in proper, librarians generally have a certain approach to uh, faculty support, faculty training, faculty service that's different from central IT, that's different yet again from teaching and learning centers. Librarians often have a certain perspective on intellectual property and openness to information that, again, is probably different from teaching learning centers and very different from central IT. Uh, so there are Pressbooks clients that represent each of those different parts of the university. And increasingly, as people who are using Pressbooks want to integrate with other campus centralized tools, we have to somehow, uh, on our side, help coordinate, like, help the librarian connect with the person who manages the single sign-on, help the librarians connect with the person who manages the LMS and satisfy the LMS administrator's questions about data security and about all the other kinds of things that need to happen. And so I think we're learning along with many of you what's needed in those cases. Hopefully we have uh, some skills and some answers for doing that, but those of you who are further along the path, if there are things that have proven helpful, we definitely want to know what they are so that we can generalize them and make that path smoother for other people because that that transition is sometimes awkward sometimes there's like a a very complicated memorandum of understanding that's drafted between three or four different departments about who's responsible for what in relation to press books you know and that that often looks different depending on the kind of institution you are the size and sometimes frankly the the maturity or the age of your publishing program um so that's my non-committal answer to the specific question you asked, yeah. All right, we are coming up on the top of the hour and uh, you are all busy people. And so I I want to uh, loop things uh, back. Um, before I do that, Bashak, any final comments from you? I just saw someone posted, uh, see it open ed. Um, please come and find me. We're going to be there. I will try to come and find you. I'd love to meet in person. And I look forward to meeting uh, uh, many others of you in, in person as well. So I just wanted to leave it out there that uh, I will be going to conferences and I'm excited for those to meet all of you. All right. That is a perfect transition to uh, what I do want to share. So here on, sorry, hold on. My Here we go. All right, so upcoming events. Um, we do want to remind you all of our, uh, our our webinars that are training webinars. Anyone is open um, is is able to come to those. So be sure to join or uh, invite your instructors and interested users to come to those events. Um, and the next ones are are listed. Um, we uh, let's see. I think Hugh Bashak, John, and I will be in person at the Open Education Conference. 
Um, a number of our team will also be participating virtually. Um, and so uh, look for us at that event, whether you're uh, participating in person or virtually. And then we also are planning to attend the OLC Accelerate Conference in uh, November for any folks that happen to be coming to that. Okay. So um, we are uh, at the top of the hour. And so we will uh, formally wrap up our uh, the, the prepared version. Um, if anybody wants to stay on though and uh, uh, share things, ask a few more questions or whatever, um, I have a few more minutes, so I'm happy to stay on. And uh, Ashok, I don't know if you have a hard stop, um, but we can certainly put that out there for a couple of minutes. I'm happy to stay on for a couple of minutes too. All right, and I think I need to, I'm good. this is the point where I stop the recording.